Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. Kobus, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Well, today, Kobus, we're going to be talking about a very important subject and one that we actually have not addressed in the eight years that we've done this podcast, which is surprising, given China's increasingly large role in the United Nations system and multilateralism as a whole. And this is particularly interesting at this time in history because a lot of Western countries and Western politicians, particularly in places like France with Marine Le Pen, uh, the United States with Donald Trump, obviously the Brexit, uh, you know, the people behind Brexit, are questioning multilateralism in many, many different ways. And it's interesting because Xi Jinping, the president of China, he is coming out with a full-throated embrace of multilateralism. Most recently at the Davos summit in Switzerland, he came out and talked about globalization and the need for more interdependence, increased trade. And in some ways, he's picking up the mantle of what the United States has long preached, which is this system of interdependency that countries have with one another. So we're going to talk a little bit about the UN system, the IMF, some of the Bretton Woods institutions, which are particularly important for Africa. Yes, this is is really an interesting issue for me because on one hand you have the Western countries that that seem very ambivalent about multilateralism at the moment. And in the process, there seem to be a, a certain kind of story of globalization is shifting away from the West more towards the global South. At the same time, these developments are crucial for Africa um, because Africa is frequently so dependent on, on, on multilateral organizations for, you know, in, in, in lots of different ways. But also there's a lot of complaints within Africa about the positioning the, of the, of African countries within that system. So it's, it's a really a ripe area to discuss. And I think in Africa, when most people think of the United Nations system, typically Europeans come to mind in part because of the long history that Europeans have had in Africa. Uh, but a lot of people are actually surprised to hear about the role of China. Before we get to our guest, let me read a few factoids for you about the Chinese and their role. Uh, China contributes more troops to the UN peacekeeping on missions in Africa than any other permanent member of the UN Security Council. I think the number right now is somewhere around 8,000, but 3,000 combat troops. Uh, and I'll get some, we'll get some verification on that in our, in our discussion. And what's interesting is that most of these forces are in highly specialized roles in engineering, in medicine, uh, in logistics. And so these are very, very important roles in the United Nations uh, in, in Africa. Uh, Back in 2015, Chinese President Xi Jinping committed 8,000 troops to the UN peacekeeping standby force, one-fifth of the 40,000 total troops committed by 50 nations. So you can see how disproportionate the Chinese role is there. China also pledged $100 million to the African Union standby force and a billion dollars to establish the UN Peace and Development Trust Fund. One other interesting fact, since 2008, China has also been one of the major players in anti-piracy operations off the coast of Somalia. And this has been very interesting to watch because this is really one of the first major deployments of the Chinese Navy so far uh, away from Asia. So really, there's some exciting, interesting things that are happening here. A lot of people don't understand it. So we thought it would be great to speak with somebody on the inside. Uh, Nicholas Rossellini is the coordinator of the United Nations in China, and he's also the head of the UNDP, which is the United Nations Development Program in China. He's uh, really got a long, long resume with the United Nations. Most recently, uh, he was also the former UNDP Deputy Regional Director for Asia and Pacific. He's lived and worked all over the world, including Ghana and Ethiopia, and we're thrilled to have him on the show for the first time from Beijing. Nicholas, thank you for joining us. No, thank you for for inviting me on. I'm a, a big fan of your podcast. So oh, I'm happy to be on. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, you know, let's talk about multilateralism. For a long time, the United States uh, has kind of put this pressure on China to kind of become a more responsible global actor, and in many ways, the United States pressured China in order to take a bigger role in the United Nations, in peacekeeping, in global stability and some of these issues. It does appear that under Xi Jinping and even before that under Hu Jintao, the, his predecessor, there was this, um, this sense that China did want to step up and play. Tell us a little bit about the current state of China's engagement in the United Nations system, but particularly with a focus on Africa. Well, I'm, I'm fairly new here in China. I've been here about six months. And even though I was following developments in China before that, um, it was at a bit of a distance. So coming to China, I, I was very 
surprised and impressed by the the very wide scope and and increasing involvement of China in, in the United Nations system. You've mentioned the peacekeeping, and I, I think uh, there's this uh, standby of 8,000 troops, and there's about two and a half thousand, uh, over two and a half thousand, currently deployed. They're actually in 10 missions worldwide, but six of those missions are in African countries. Um, so, peacekeeping, as you said yourself, uh, China now is one of the major players in, in financial terms as well as in troop contributing terms. But there's also its role in humanitarian affairs, which is also fairly new in a multilateral sense. Um, it uh, contributed very generously, for example, to the uh, fundraising for the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which was in uh, 2014, I think. It's also looking uh, at contributions to the UN system itself. It's already the third largest uh, contributor to the core United Nations, uh, the Secretariat, what we call the Secretariat, uh, where you have uh, assessed contributions, and they're the third largest contributor to that. But they're also increasing contributions to the development part of the of the UN system. They've promised to commit another $100 million uh, to UN agencies for their work uh, uh, by 2020. And a lot of this money will be spent in Africa, on, on projects in Africa. They uh, have um, al also uh, created a peace and development fund uh, f for use uh, and a South-South fund, which uh, can be used by multilateral agencies. Uh, I think that's $2 billion, and the peace and development fund is $1 billion. So, uh, I mean, what, what I've seen is that China's really coming out as a champion for global development issues. And, and this is very good news for the multilateral world. It's very interesting. Um, so, you, Nicholas, you recently took a, a tour of, um, of uh, as, as I understand, you went to, to Ethiopia and Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire um, mm. to look at, uh, at, at a, you know, kind of a set of projects um, related to China's work in Africa. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what kinds of projects you looked at and, and what you found. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted the chance to see firsthand, you know, what everyone's talking about, which is this enormous growth in uh, China development cooperation in Africa. Uh, it takes many forms, of course. I mean, and, and uh, it's it can be grant, it's uh, concessional loans, it's uh, commercial investments. Uh, it, it covers the whole spectrum of financial flows. But what I wanted to see was specifically more on the on the south-south, more on the grant side. Um, I started in Côte d'Ivoire, <clears throat> where there was a, a, a large conference uh, for, for African countries uh, called Emerging Africa. And there the main theme was uh, industrialization and what was needed in Africa really to create the jobs uh, that are needed. I mean, there's a chronic problem in many African countries of either unemployment or underemployment. You're also, with the investments in the educational systems in, in, in many African countries, you've also got young people coming out of university, coming out of high school, uh, with really uh, either no jobs or very badly paid jobs to go into. So there, there was tremendous interest in the African countries in terms of how to industrialize. Um, and, and we had some discussions there. We had uh, Professor Justin Lin was there uh, about uh, using uh, labor-intensive manufacturing as a, as a, as a starting po point for uh, industrialization and, and particularly using industrial zones, uh, which have started in Ethiopia and in Rwanda. So that, that was an interesting look uh, at some aspects of development. Uh, we often, particularly in the UN, I think, are looking at the social sectors, at health, education, water supply. But what is needed in, in many African countries is really the opportunity to grow the economy at scale, I mean, to create jobs uh, within the economy at a large scale. Uh, after that, I, I went to Ghana, and there it was more at the project level. Uh, and there I was looking at uh, renewable energy. Ghana is actually in better shape than most countries in Africa in terms of access to electricity. Um, I, I think they have 80% uh, of people have some sort of access to the grid, uh, whereas the African average, I think, is 60%. So 
but still in the north, there's still many areas which do not have access to the grid, and there's a lot of scope there uh, for off-grid solutions and, and using solar energy, uh, both for production, for example, in agriculture, uh, for irrigation, as well as for the households, for lighting and cooking. Um, and there, China is getting involved uh, w with Ghana. Um, I visited a, a project run by an NGO, which will help um, in, in terms of the demonstration um, of, of how, how this can work. Uh, and China's been helping with a renewable, uh, giving a technical advice to Ghana on a renewable energy master plan. Uh, and now we want to see how we put that into effect at, at the local level. And we'll be working with the Ghana uh, government uh, and with the China government to make this happen. Uh, then I went to Ethiopia, uh, and, and there really was to see uh, the in industrial zones. So I went to one of the industrial zones to see how that actually works. Um, they were producing uh, garments and shoes. The garments were outerwear garments for Italy. The shoes were actually being exported to China, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, you know, heard a bit about the growth potential there. I mean, this estate already had 14,000 workers. Uh, and also some of the, the, you know, the constraints and so on that uh, need to be looked at. So all in all, it was three very different looks at... Uh, at South-South cooperation between China and African countries. But a lot of it came back to how can these countries really enter the global markets? I mean, how, how do you get the basic infrastructure in place, the access to energy in place so people can be productive? Uh, and then how do you use that to a, a larger scale, you know, to really ramp up the investments and, and create the employment opportunities. Yeah, you, you, yeah you, you've said it's all about jobs and the economy. And, and that brings up an interesting point, because back when I started studying China-Africa relations for the first time, I'd say about 10 years ago, um, China was actually rather vocal that it didn't want to follow the West's development agenda in Africa. It would articulate and say that, you know, the United States and Europe had spent a trillion dollars since the end of colonialism in Africa and didn't have many results to show for it. Meanwhile, China uh, became the second largest economy in the world, largely without aid and largely without the UN system and the Bretton Woods institutions. And so the Chinese said that they were going to take a very different approach, which is where they did the – followed the, the Japanese model. And there's a great book uh, written by Deborah Braudigam that kind of explains how China's development model came about. And they wanted to bring that to Africa, where they would kind of exchange natural resources for infrastructure. And that's what we see today. But they really were very conscious about not following in the path of the West – and yet now in the past four or five years, we've seen a real reversal in some ways and an embrace of this system, of this very system. And I'm wondering, have you seen that same kind of trajectory uh, where there was this resistance to engage what the West was doing in Africa and now it seems like they are kind of picking up and, you know, raising the ante? Yeah, I, I think there, there has been a change. But development, I think, needs a, a lot of um, investment in, in many different directions. If you look at the the uh, 2030 Agenda for th Sustainable Development, there are a large number of goals and targets, uh, and, and it really covers almost everything. It, it covers jobs, it covers the environment, it, it covers um, the social sectors as well, I mean, health and education. And it's very important that we look at these in totality. I mean, countries need the infrastructure in place uh, in order to uh, create jobs and employment. Uh, 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 countries need some sort of industrial strategy and a growth strategy in order to uh, provide livelihoods to their citizens. And they also need the, the investment in services, which is uh, what a lot of Western uh, assistance concentrated on, particularly in the period of the early 2000s, with the Millennium Development Goal period. Um, so, I mean, all of these things have to be tackled. Uh, and I think China has the potential, the way China's working has a kind of potential to be a, a real accelerator because what, what I've seen is, is that they're bringing in both uh, the infrastructure, but they, they can also bring in the enterprise investment, whether it's private sector or state enterprise investment, uh, which can create the jobs. Uh, and they also 
I'm still working on 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 the soft uh, sectors as well. Uh, but then, of course, we've also got the other uh, development agencies that are doing that. So if we can somehow align these different kind of investment streams that are needed and, and very importantly, make sure this is all delivered sustainably, I mean, taking into account the environment, uh, the social sustainability and, and the economic sustainability, uh, then I, I think that the China model can really help help to accelerate development in many of these countries. But uh, let me just inter- interrupt. Sorry, mm. Kobus. I just want to ask one quick, very quick follow-up question. China, when it comes to the environment, is really not a good example. I mean, if we've seen you're living in Beijing where the AQI, yep. the air quality index, is regularly over 300. So if I'm an African sitting in, you know, in Ethiopia or in Kenya or somewhere else, and I look at what China's done to their environment, um, I don't have an enormous amount of confidence that this is going to really benefit me if we import the China model to Africa. Well, the, I, I think it depends uh, how you, what kind of projects you're looking at. I mean, what Chinese uh, tell me all the time is they, they're not trying to export that model and they don't want to uh, export uh, industries or types of projects that can affect the environment. I mean, for example, uh, at the industrial zone uh, in Ethiopia, they've installed systems which have um, uh, z- zero waste. In other words, the 100% water recycling. Uh, so apparently, I'm not an expert, but in manufacturing of garments and shoes makes a lot of wastewater, particularly with the dyeing and so on. Um, and, and they've installed systems that actually make sure all the water is, is recycled and there's no runoff. They're also very much emphasizing renewable energy. So uh, uh, the solar power, um, biogas uh, are being uh, offered uh, as options. What we've um, offered as the UN is, is to work with China, uh, both in China uh, with the um, businesses uh, in terms of sustainable, doing sustainable business uh, and raising awareness of some of these environmental issues. And, and also in the partner countries in Africa, where we also, of course, have our country offices and we have capacity uh, to ensure that the... Uh, projects are situated within the local development environment, that, that these issues around, you know, the feasibility studies are done, uh, pre-investment work is done, uh, and that we can make sure that uh, uh, these investments are as uh, green as possible. You mentioned the, the UN's Millennium Development Goals, um, and I was wondering whether there is a kind of philosophical differences between the UN's idea of development and Africa and China's idea of development. Um, in the past, uh, African governments have complained a lot about finding it very difficult to get financing for infrastructure from from Western institutions or Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank, um, and that it was easier for them to get that from China. Um, meanwhile, the, so, so both China and Africa seem to share a very strong focus on things like infrastructure building um, in, in, as, as, a, as an engine of development. Um, meanwhile, the UN... You know, which I might be oversimplifying the UN's position, but you know, um, it, it seems like the UN is focusing a lot on social upliftment and social the social side of development, including things like gender equality, maternal health, um, healthcare. Um, are the are China, Africa, and the UN hundred percent on the same page in terms of what development means for them? Yes, yes. I, I think I think a very short answer to that is yes. The Millennium Development Goals were devised by a very small group of people sitting in New York, and they were pretty top-down. Um, and they were narrow in the sense of, of focusing on, on a very small set of drivers of development, which are extremely important. I don't want to belittle them. I mean, uh, the, the gender, health, environment, um, education, I mean, the, these are all very important for the quality of life. The SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, on the other hand, underwent an enormous process of of discussion before they were drawn up, uh, both uh, by all the member states of the United Nations, uh, as as well as through uh, surveys, uh, popular popular surveys of of, of people and and so on. So the the SDGs are much more wide-ranging, and they have the space there to talk about issues around jobs, around industrialization, and so on. Uh, 
and there is an underpinning uh, of infrastructure. There's um, estimates made. Uh, there was a, a, a report made a couple of years ago by UNDP with the Regional Economic Commission for Asia Pacific and with the Asian Development Bank, w which did some costings in terms of, of what the infrastructure needs are. Um, now the the thing is with the SDGs. Then I, I think it is it does cover all these concerns. I mean, it's still got a heavy emphasis on the quality of development. That every I mean, economic growth, which doesn't also improve the quality of life of the people, uh, is empty. Uh, so there's still that need to insist on the quality of development, whether and and the the social and uh, environmental consequences for development. Uh, but there is also there the recognition that we do have to invest in infrastructure and, and it, it's really critical that we invest in sectors that create jobs. So I, I think now we have brought together these different development agendas in, into the sustainable development goals. And, and, and in that sense, there is a, a very big buy-in from China. If, if you see uh, President Xi went to the General Assembly in, in September 2015 when the sustainable development goals were adopted, um, he's made a number of commitments to uh, support financially uh, and the, the sustainable development goals. They've been uh, integrated into the, the five-year development plan here, the one that started in 2016. So I, I think to us in the UN, we see China actually as a champion of this new global development agenda, the sustainable development goals, and, and, and what they're doing in terms of enlarging the global market. I mean, the, the you know, looking at globalization uh, to, when accompanied by a, a socially progressive uh, agenda such as the sustainable goals, I think it is, as they say, a win-win. Yeah. I, I want to kind of close out our discussion on, on, a, on, a, on the question of how China is going to change the United Nations. Um, the United Nations, you know, suffers an enormous amount of criticism. I I'm not sure how much of it's worthwhile or not, but let's just put it out there that it is a, a relic of another era. This is, you know, the Security Council features, you know, France and Britain, which by today are relatively small countries compared to India and, and, uh, and Brazil and obviously China. Uh, and the voice of the United Nations, particularly the Security Council, is one that represents the Western powers. This was a product of the post-war system in the United States. It was built by the United States and was built during a time when the United States had economic supremacy. And if the past 400 years of economic history tells us one thing, it's that whoever is the largest economy in the world generally gets to make the rules. That was the case in the British during their reign. Then the Americans during their reign, Pax Americana now is, is in decline, relatively speaking. And soon China, if it's not already, will be the largest economy in the world. So if we follow that theory that the largest economy in the world gets to make the rules, which is often the way it is, how are they going to change the United Nations system? And I, I ask this because there's been a lot of frustration with the Chinese uh, in Washington about their ability to influence the World Bank and the IMF. So what did they do? They went out and started the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, they are now kind of doing much more in the bilateral, and they are shaping the world in their image and in their way uh, outside of the major international institutions. And I guess I'm curious that they're doing all of this. They're investing all this money, all these exciting things that you've talked about. They're going to expect to have a larger voice. And I'm curious about how the, you think from inside the United Nations – that deeply entrenched status quo will adapt to this new reality and the change that might be coming? Some of this is, uh, frankly, beyond me. I mean, this is really the political negotiation of, of the member states. Um, but I, I think any observer, or, or for that matter, people who work in the UN, can see that a system of governance, uh, which was developed in, in the World War II, II era, uh, and we're now in the 21st century, needs to be looked at. Um, I mean, I, I can't comment on how it should be changed, but I, I think people do understand the need to revisit how global governance works um, and, and how the, the big institutions are, uh, that were set up work in the future. Um, and, I mean, it may be a long and pay f painful process, but I, I'm, I'm sure over time uh, changes will uh, begin to be made. 
I, I see uh, China working very constructively within these bodies. I, as I said, I mean, there's been a, a very wholehearted commitment of China to the world development agenda, as shown in the Sustainable Development Goals. It, it's been very much involved in the peacekeeping and humanitarian work of the UN as well. So I, I see China now uh, as very much a, a constructive member uh, when one looks at those aspects of what the UN does. The creation of other um, organizations, I, I think, is not a bad thing. I think it can be quite healthy to have a, a range of options. Um, AIB was set up, people were concerned, you know, how it would be run. Uh, there was a lot of concern about environmental guidelines for projects. But I, as far as I know, in the end, they've adopted something pretty much the, the same standard as the World Bank has. And, and, the, and there's a shareholding structure, uh, you know, with people of, of, from different regions and countries in, in the vice president positions and so on. So uh, I, I think the, at least on the development side, the underlying principles of development, which regardless of, of whether the, the, you're talking about a Western country, a traditional donor, or you're talking about China and, and its own development cooperation, there are certain development principles that will need to be taken up if countries want to see value for money, if they want to see impact of their support. Uh, and these are around um, working to build up the national institutions, national capacities to implement uh, national ownership, uh, as well as around the principles of sustainability, uh, respecting the environment, consulting communities, and so on. Uh, and and I, I think we will see some sort of a convergence over time, at least on some of these principles. Uh, and certainly, in terms of global governance, uh, a bigger a bigger voice for countries like China, but not only China. I mean, there are many other uh, uh, large developing countries that uh, need to be listened to. I mean, uh, in Asia, there is um, large G20 countries uh, such as Indonesia, such as India. In Latin America, there's Brazil and Argentina. And of course, in Africa, uh, you know, we have the, uh, you know, uh, South Africa and Nigeria and you know, many, many other countries that uh, need more voice. Well, I'm one of those who supports uh, a, a little shaking things up a little bit. I think it's uh, it's it's overdue. Uh, Nicholas Rossellini is the coordinator of the United Nations in China and head of the United Nations Development Program there in Beijing. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really an honor to have you on the program and to talk a little bit more about what China is doing within the UN system and multilateralism. And we we hope to have you back again to update everybody on on how things progress. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. Kobus, you know, we didn't have time to get to some of the controversies that the Chinese have had in, regarding the United Nations in, uh, in Africa. Uh, the United Nations peacekeepers in South Sudan were accused by rights groups of fleeing their base when they came under attack. Uh, there's also been criticisms of the fact that the United Nations system as a whole tends to favor state-to-state -state relationships, which, you know, deeply entrenched elites in Africa are, are not always the most transparent with their governance. And this reaffirms and really deeply engages the Chinese into that state-to-state -state relationship, not really emphasizing civil society. Some of these things you've talked a lot about in the past about the, the inability for civil society in Africa to grow so long as corrupt state administrators are in charge. And some criticisms may say that, you know, this idea of the United Nations and China's embrace of the United Nations is an embrace of elites. Yes, that is an issue, I think. Um, but that, of course, was an issue in the, the general discussion of China-Africa relations as well. I mean, China itself tends to bilateral relationships and it tends to elite elite relationships rather than, you know, kind of that civil society. China, that is a tendency that, that was, you know, kind of an, an involvement, you know, that was part of, of China's engagement from the beginning. So I think that it, it opens wider issues, uh, you know, relating to development and state state relationships that touch both on the UN and China itself. Itself and Africa, because you know, kind of, if there is, if there is a continent that loves elite relations, it's Africa. So, um, so I, you know, kind of, I, I think it, it opens question, up questions that we all need to discuss. For which I think, you know, coming going into the future, the UN could be a fantastic kind of forum to have that discussion in. Well, we hope to have the discussion uh, on this program a lot more coming up 
in the next few weeks. So we'll, we'll definitely like to have Nicolas come back and more people from the UNDP and what the United Nations is doing, because as Koba said at the top of the show, it does play such an important role in Africa. And I think China's role is largely either misunderstood or uh, just not very, most people aren't aware of what's going on. So I think it's a great topic for us to explore. Uh, that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the show. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at E. Olander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.